Freddy, Michael, Jason, Chucky, they're all names that live in horror infamy. And that's why today we're going to be focusing in on those horror movie villains that never fail to send a shiver down our spines. But why do they do the evil things that they do? Well, we're starting with these twisted motivations. Don't let her live. I won't, Jason. I won't. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 horror movie villain motivations. Yeah, that's too. I think she wants a motive. <laughs> Rudeness is epidemic. For this list, we're looking at the best motivations given to horror film villains, whether they be tragic, scary, or just straight up badass. Of course, there will be spoilers. Which of these villains is your favorite? Number 20, Samara, The Ring. You don't want to hurt anyone. But I do, and I'm sorry. It won't stop. Samara had it rough from the start. Her mother was kept prisoner in a basement and repeatedly assailed by a priest. Samara was born with psychic powers owing to the presence of the ocean entity, which later granted her the ability to make cursed videotapes. Samara's mother went mad and attempted drowning baby Samara in a fountain, but she was rescued at the last second by a group of nuns. Following a turbulent adolescence, Samara's adoptive mother used a garbage bag on her before tossing her down a well. Now a vengeful spirit ghost thing with a hatred for humans, Samara uses her psychic powers to live through the videotapes, ending anyone who watches them. Number 19, Julia Cotton, Hellraiser and Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. Julia Cotton was actually supposed to be the primary antagonist of the Hellraiser franchise, but the popularity of Pinhead ensured her demotion. Tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. Julia is the wife of Larry Cotton, but she's having an affair with his brother Frank. Frank violently dies after conjuring the Cenobites, and he reappears to Julia in a grotesque form, telling her that he can be healed if provided with fresh blood. She then makes a practice of kidnapping various men and bringing them to her blood sucking ex lover. Did you love this? <laughs> She is eventually betrayed by Frank, but gets her revenge in the sequel after she's revived by Dr. Chenard. No! Take your best shot, Snow White. Ah! Hey, like Jamie Lannister says, Things I do for love. Number 18, Billy Chapman, Silent Night, Deadly Night. You, she's Santa Claus tonight, you better run for it. You better run for your life. This movie is not great, but it's one of those so bad it's good movies that makes for perfect 2 a.m. viewing, and it's developed quite a cult following. It concerns a psychotic Santa Claus named Billy Chapman. Billy's parents were ambushed by a criminal dressed as Santa, and it skewered Billy's outlook on Old Saint Nick. He eventually snaps after being asked to put on a Santa suit and goes on a murderous rampage, slaying whomever he deems naughty. You know, like Santa. Punish. It's such a bizarre and terrible motivation that it circles back around too brilliant. That is indicative of the movie in general. Die. Number 17, Ely, Let the Right One In. One of the most poetic and beautiful vampire movies ever made, Let the Right One In concerns two preteens named Oscar and Ely. Oscar is a lonely and mistreated kid, and he eventually takes a liking to his next-door neighbor, Ely, 
the two share a mutual crush, but their relationship contains a dark undercurrent. Ely is a vampire, and she uses an older man named Hokan to harvest people's blood for her. On the odd occasion, Ely ventures out herself to drink from her victims directly. She needs to do this for her very survival, as most vampires do. However, Ely takes it one step further by persuading Oscar into joining her, and he eventually becomes her next Hokan. Number 16, Asami, Audition. Yamasaki Asami des. Dozo. Domo, o matase shimashita. Ie. Eh, ima made ni eiga to ka telebi no shigoto wa nando ka soyo hanashi wa arimashita kedo, mada yatta koto wa arimasen. This Japanese horror film is mainly known for its violent sequences involving Asami Yamazaki. Asami hates men and wishes to inflict physical harm on them owing to a traumatic childhood. She torments the men who wrong her, or seemingly wrong her, and when she finds a picture of Oyama's late wife, she flies into a psychotic rage and poisons his drink. What results is one of the most famous endings in movie history, as Asami is so brutal with Oyama and so disgusting with another victim who's missing various body parts that we won't even show you the scene in its entirety. <laughs> the woman is seriously messed up, and she makes for one of horror's most iconic villains. Number 15, The Lab, The Cabin in the Woods. Drew Goddard's The Cabin in the Woods is a hilarious deconstruction of the slasher genre, and it contains one of the most unique storylines in modern horror. An underground laboratory harbors gigantic godlike creatures known as the Ancient Ones, and they require annual human sacrifices to prevent them from taking over the world. To do so, the lab employees draw various slasher movie archetypes to a desolate cabin in the woods, where they in turn manipulate the proceedings to have the victims die. Okay, I swear to God, somebody is talking. I'm pretty sure someone is. Oh. I'm gonna go for a walk. No! What are you saying? Huh? What do you want? Saving humanity from bloodthirsty underground gods seems like a pretty good motivation to us. Number 14, The Armitage Family, Get Out. Serving as a perfect example of Jordan Peele's unique blend of straightforward horror and social commentary, Get Out portrays an upper-class white family that heads a cult whose goal is to live forever. To do this, they appropriate the bodies of young black people that feature the characteristics they lack. They bring their victims to their house in upstate New York, where members of the cult can claim them in an auction. The winner's brain is then transplanted into the victim's head, while the victim's consciousness is sent to the sunken place, with awareness but no agency over their own body. No. I'll control the motor function, so I'll be... Me. You'll be me. Good. Good. You got it quick. Good on you. Oh, well, yes. Why black people? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Quite the statement from a first-time director, and one that won him an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay. Number 13, Billy Loomis and Stu Mocker, Scream. The Scream franchise contains a lot of great and surprising villains, but it's hard to beat the originals. See, it's a lot scarier when there's no motive, Sid. Billy and Stu tag-teamed the first movie, and their motivations, or lack thereof, are easily the most entertaining. Billy seems to be the ringleader of the entire operation, and Stu is simply along for the ride. Watch a few movies, take a few notes. 
It was fun. <laughs> Billy is a self-admitted psychopath who suffers from paternal abandonment issues, and he seeks revenge against Sydney for what her mother did to his family. How's that for a motive? And Stu is just there for the laughs, wanting to stab people with his good pal Billy. Or, as he puts it, peer pressure. He's far too sensitive. Number 12. Annie Wilkes, Misery Winning the Academy Award for Best Actress, Kathy Bates played one of the all-time greatest villains in Annie Wilkes. Stephen King had written a high fantasy novel called The Eyes of the Dragon that was met with fierce hatred from his fan base, inspiring him to craft the character of Annie. You're gonna be just fine. I'll take good care of you. I'm your number one fan. We're just outside Silver Creek. How long? You've been here two days. You're gonna be okay. My name is Annie Wilkes. She is a fan of novelist Paul Sheldon, but she hates the fact that he axed off his most popular character. To remedy that, Annie keeps Paul imprisoned in her secluded house and forces him to write a new novel that will bring the character back to life. You just expect me to whip something off, is that it? I expect nothing less than your masterpiece. You do understand that this is not the ordinary way in which books get written. I mean, some people might actually consider this an oddball situation. I have total confidence in your brilliance. Besides, the view will inspire you. You just inhale that. I'll be right back. Like all great satire, there's an undercurrent of truth to the character of Annie, and it makes her all the more terrifying. Number 11. The Monster, Frankenstein Boris Karloff's iconic character is not only one of the best villains in movie history, but also one of the most sympathetic. Mary Shelley wrote the story to criticize humanity's hubris, and the monster is the result. Dr. Frankenstein wishes to make a living human out of various body parts compiled from criminals and recently buried corpses. While it starts life as an innocent creature, the monster soon grows violent after becoming tormented by the sadistic Fritz. Quiet! Quiet! It destroys Fritz, Waldman, and an innocent little girl before it's hunted by an angry mob, who eventually torches it alive inside a windmill. <laughs> The monster is nothing but a mindless creature acting on pure survival instinct, and said instinct causes a lot of deaths. Number 10. Imhotep – The Mummy Based on another legendary universal horror film, The Mummy stars Arnold Vosloo as Imhotep, a seriously ticked-off and love-struck mummy who's been imprisoned for thousands of years. Back in ancient Egypt, Imhotep had an affair with the pharaoh's mistress, Anaxunamun, and they murder the pharaoh once he discovered the dalliance. In return, the pharaoh's bodyguards buried Imhotep alive. He was to remain sealed inside his sarcophagus, the undead for all of eternity. The Magi would never allow him to be released for he would arise a walking disease, a plague upon mankind, an unholy flesh-eater with the strength of ages, power over the sands, and the glory of invincibility. Thousands of years later, Imhotep is brought back with the Book of the Dead and goes on a rampage, wishing to sacrifice Evelyn to resurrect Anaxunamun. <laughs> Sachem! I found an EV on Cloudy! 
Rute Amunra. Shut up and get me off here, Jonathan! Open the book, Jonathan! It's the only way to kill him! You have to open the book and find the inscription! Well, I, I can't open it! It's locked to something! We need the key, you mean? The man has a taste for life after being dead for millennia and will do anything to get his old lover back. It's kind of cute in a really twisted way. Number 9. Chucky, Child's Play Hi, I'm Chucky, wanna play? <laughs> Despite its absolutely ridiculous premise, Child's Play somehow works. The story concerns Charles Lee Ray, who transfers his soul into a doll while dying in a toy store. Now in the body of one known as Chucky, Ray goes on a slasher spree while desperately trying to escape his newfound plastic confines and return to a human body. Said body needs to be that of Andy, his young owner. Give me the power, I beg of you! Chucky makes for one of the most unique villains in the horror genre, and we certainly understand his plight. Living inside the body of a plastic doll sounds positively terrible. Then again, it is his own fault he's in there. Number 8. Norman Bates, Psycho Mother, my mother, uh, what is the phrase? She isn't qu quite herself today. You shouldn't have bothered. I really don't have that much of an appetite. Oh, I'm sorry. I wish you could apologize for other people. Billy may have suffered from parental abandonment issues, but Norman Bates takes that concept to a whole other level. I got the whole story, but not from Norman. I got it from his mother. Norman Bates no longer exists. He only half existed to begin with. And now, the other half has taken over. Probably for all time. Thanks to the ending filled with admittedly clunky exposition, audiences learned the true motivation of Norman Bates. Norman loved his mother to an unhealthy degree and felt possessive of her, so he offed her out of jealousy when she met a lover. He keeps her body in the basement of his house and dresses in her clothes as a way to keep her spirit alive. And he knifes women he feels attracted to, perhaps to remain loyal to his mother. Or he's just a psycho who enjoys the thrill of what he does. Either way, it is insanely creepy. Number 7. The Children – Children of the Corn Taking place in a fictional Nebraska town, the titular Children of the Corn is a cult that worships an entity known as He Who Walks Behind the Rose. He wants you too, Malachi. Led and indoctrinated by 12-year-old Isaac Croner, the children destroy all the adults of the town in a violent revolution. Whenever someone turns 19, they are deemed an adult and asked to undergo a passing, that is, to die for the cause. What are you, crazy? What do you think you're doing? My passage. It's my birthday. You got a pretty sick way of celebrating it, pal. Listen, I don't... Silence, interloper. Your presence does profane this holy place. He will reckon with you. Well, that's terrific. I don't know who he is, but maybe he'd like to discuss the medical side of what's going on here with me. It's as it should be. Amos! It's as it is written. Speak no more to him. He is an unbeliever. Hurry, get Isaac! No, wait! 
Bring Malachi. Cult movies are certainly nothing new, but the concept of murderous children living in a ghost town, worshipping a bloodthirsty demon, and sacrificing others to appease it is definitely an original one. Number 6. Angela Slash Peter – Sleepaway Camp Containing one of the most famous endings in the slasher genre, Sleepaway Camp is a cult favorite with an iconic villain. In 1975, brother and sister Angela and Peter were swimming in a lake when an accident occurred, resulting in the death of Peter. The surviving Angela is sent to Camp Arawak, where she is immediately tormented for her shy and passive personality. So how about it, Angela? Let's go for a swim. Oh, what's the matter? You afraid? Huh? In the end, it's revealed that Peter actually survived the accident, not Angela, and that Peter had been raised as a girl by his Aunt Martha, taking his late sister's name. As Angela, he took vengeance upon anyone in the camp who threatened or tormented him. Number 5. Jason and Mrs. Voorhees, the Friday the 13th franchise. Sleepaway Camp may be a cult favorite, but Friday the 13th is arguably the most famous slasher in the history of the genre. It also shares much in common with its obvious spiritual successor. Jason was a young child in the late 1950s, and he drowned at Camp Crystal Lake while the irresponsible counselors were getting frisky in a cabin. Seeking revenge for her boy's death, Mrs. Voorhees returns to the camp after it reopens, hoping to off as many camp counselors as she can, even though they have no personal connection to Jason's death. Look what you did to him! <laughs> Following her demise, a not-so-dead Jason takes up the mantle and slaughters counselors himself for the sheer heck of it. <laughs> Number 4. Candyman – The Candyman Franchise I am the writing on the wall, the whisper in the classroom. Without these things, I am nothing. So now, I must shed innocent blood." Following the success of Hellraiser, writer-director Bernard Rose adapted Clive Barker's The Forbidden for the big screen, changing its title to Candyman. The titular Candyman is Daniel Robitaille, a famous black artist who was killed after sleeping with a white landowner's daughter and fathering her child. Right before dying, Robitaille's soul was transferred into a mirror, and he now lives on as the Candyman myth. To ensure his continued survival, the myth must stay relevant. And to keep the myth relevant, the Candyman sheds innocent blood, typically those who say his name five times in a mirror. She looked in the mirror. And I don't know why, but she said his name the last time. Candyman. She turned out the lights. We certainly don't condone shedding innocent blood, but wanting to stay alive is a pretty darned good motivation. Number 3. Freddy Krueger – A Nightmare on Elm Street Freddy is arguably the scariest slasher. He looks terrifying with his grotesquely scarred face, he playfully toys with his victims, and there's literally no escaping him thanks to warped dream logic and, you know, the biological function of having to sleep. But he also has a horrifying background and motivation. It's too late, Kruger. I know the secret now. This is just a dream. You're not alive. This whole thing is just a dream. In life, Kruger was a famous murderer of youngins who was burned to death by angry and vengeful parents. Now he's a creepy dream spirit with the ability to take out people in their sleep, and he hunts the children of the town in revenge for his death. Both in life and in the dream space, Freddy Krueger is one malicious man. Number 2. Hannibal Lecter 
Hannibal Rising In The Silence of the Lambs, Hannibal Lecter is portrayed as a simple cannibal, with no motivation given or needed. No one was really asking for a Hannibal Lecter origin story, but we got one anyway. And it was actually pretty interesting. Hannibal was a child living in Lithuania when World War II broke out, and starving soldiers used Hannibal's sister to feed themselves. Perhaps unsurprisingly, they forced Hannibal to do the same, instilling within him a taste for human flesh. He then proceeds to seek revenge against the soldiers, kickstarting his psychopathic practices. What did I do to you? Aside from eating my sister, not Hannibal is an evil, evil man, but finding out that something like this happened to your sister is sure to mess anyone up. indeed. Number 1. Jigsaw – John Kramer – The Saw Franchise Hello, Amanda. You don't know me, but I know you. I want to play a game. Here's what happens if you lose. The device you're wearing is hooked into your upper and lower jaws. When the timer in the back goes off, your mouth will be permanently ripped open. Played wonderfully by Tobin Bell, the Saw movies try making Jigsaw a little more sympathetic than he perhaps deserves. Everything goes wrong for John Kramer in a painfully short span, beginning with the attack on his wife. She suffered a miscarriage as a direct result of the attack, and the death of his unborn child caused Kramer to snap. He was then diagnosed with terminal cancer, and he earned a newfound appreciation for life, both through his own impending death and the demise of his child. He then began testing people who took life for granted. Those who don't appreciate life do not deserve life. My son appreciates his life. But do you appreciate yours? Do you appreciate your son? It's a warped philosophy. There are ways to teach the value of life without resorting to crippling and disfiguring traps. But it's an interesting motivation nevertheless. Once you see death up close, Then you know what the value of life is. And that's my way. And I brought proof that it works. Okay, so for the most part, horror movie villains are pretty big, lumbering, and let's face it, kind of slow moving. But if they ever got a hold of you, it would be lights out. That's because they're just so physically imposing. I think it's time that we find out, though, just who is the strongest of the bunch. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 physically strongest horror movie villains. Sally, I hear something. Stop! Stop! You're dead! And you're taking me with you! For this list, we'll be ranking the horror icons who aren't only strong in the scare department, but who consistently wow us with their brute strength. Horror slash sci-fi hybrids will also be considered. Number 10. Xenomorphs – Alien Franchise They're the perfect killing machine, an extraterrestrial species capable of laying waste to entire civilizations. They're xenomorphs, and there's a laundry list of reasons why these resilient buggers are so tough. For starters, the xenomorphs combine the best of offensive and defensive abilities, from their acidic blood and relentless attack patterns to their impressive physical strength. Plus, the xenomorph's tail is sharpened to a bladed tip, and they are deceptively fast considering their size. Whether you're facing off against a single xenomorph or multiple attackers, you're going to have a bad time. Number 9. Pumpkinhead – Pumpkinhead Franchise <laughs> 
Stan Winston was a legendary special effects artist, responsible for award-winning work on such films as Jurassic Park, The Terminator and Predator. You're one ugly mother Perhaps slightly less well known is Winston's work as a director, specifically his debut film 1988's Pumpkinhead. <sighs> The titular creature was designed by Winston to be as physically imposing as it was visually revolting. And that's saying a lot. Pumpkinhead is literally the demon of vengeance, a powerful manifestation with a relentless determination to destroy the marked ones, named by its conjurer. It's okay, I'm sure the boy's gonna be fine. I'm sure his father's taking care of him. <laughs> Its muscular frame, sharp tail, and frightening talons make an instant impression, while that face only a mother could love is unique enough to be both fascinating and completely horrifying. Number 8. Candyman. Candyman franchise. The Candyman's origin story is brutal, so it's perhaps only fitting that he's become an equally brutal horror icon. As if his demise at the hands of a mob wasn't horrifying enough, there's the whole bee thing too. The character once known as Daniel Robitaille was slathered in honey and left for the insects, so yeah, he can now control a literal swarm of bees. <laughs> Importantly though, actor Tony Todd is a physically intimidating presence, a stately and powerful man who brings so much to the Candyman character. Be my victim. Be my victim. Oh, and then there's the Candyman hook, a sharp instrument of death that Todd wields with such quiet but imposing menace. <laughs> Candyman is one of the most underrated horror strongmen of all time. Number 7. Pluto. The Hills Have Eyes franchise. It's breakfast time! Together, Wes Craven's original The Hills Have Eyes and the 2006 remake have earned this horror franchise a devoted fanbase. There's a lot to like about these horrifying films, but at the heart of its terrifying appeal is the family of human flesh eaters who waylay unexpecting travellers in the desert. You're not supposed to play favourites with family, but as far as physical strength goes, Pluto is a clear standout. <laughs> We're particularly partial to Michael Berryman's performance in Craven's 1977 original, a big hulking bear of a man who terrorises the Carter family alongside his psychotic brethren. Michael Bailey Smith's iteration of Pluto in the 2006 film is also burly, strong and physically fearsome, making him a worthy follow-up to Berryman's definitive original. <laughs> <laughs> Number 6. Leatherface – The Texas Chainsaw Massacre Franchise <laughs> It's one of the most iconic scenes in all of horror cinema that first appearance of Leatherface in Toby Hooper's 1974 original when Gunnar Hansen emerges and smashes Kirk with a hammer. The sound design of the film is a sickening thud, and it really speaks to Leatherface's physicality. This hulking strength made all the more realistic by Hansen's own bulky frame. We can believe that the impact from Leatherface is truly that of a character with real heft and physical power, likely built up from years of slaughterhouse work and other unsavoury activities. 
That show of brutal force has forever etched itself in the minds of horror enthusiasts. Number 5. Michael Myers – Halloween Franchise Never underestimate the power of inhuman patience. It certainly seemed to do the body of young Michael Myers some good. Michael? From an unassuming murderous child, he's grown to become one of the most physically unstoppable horror icons of all time. <laughs> It isn't as if Myers is a bodybuilder or anything, but the shape wasn't messing around when he nailed poor Bob to the wall in the original Halloween. <laughs> Elsewhere, Myers has consistently showcased his resilience to death and dying, a relentless machine that's motivated like a great white to survive from sequel to sequel. Maybe it's the gas station overalls, or the raw power of that Shatner mask, but the strength of Michael Myers certainly seems to be flowing from somewhere. <laughs> Number 4. Matt Cordell – Maniac Cop Franchise Matt Cordell was a beast before he was turned into the Maniac Cop, and we have great casting to thank for that. Actor Robert Zadar was actually a college football player, musician, dancer and cop before he got the gig. That made it easy for the character actor to step into Cordell's demonic shoes as an officer who's sent to prison, only to return after his murder to take revenge on the living. Zadar looks great in a uniform and uses his size to perfectly adapt Cordell's strength and police training to the screen. It's Zadar's performance that makes it easy to buy into Maniac Cop's memorable tagline, you have the right to remain silent forever. <laughs> Number 3. Bruce – Jaws Franchise This pick might be the entry that's most relatable. Who wouldn't be afraid of a great white shark? The OG shark from Jaws, affectionately known as Bruce to the cast and crew, is strong enough to eat Quint alive, sink his ship, the Orca, and nearly take out all of our main characters. Not too shabby for a mechanical fish that consistently malfunctioned and almost bankrupt production. You guys okay over there? Today, we have Bruce to thank for the ocean of Jaws ripoffs that have filled movie screens and rental shelves. Not to mention those memorable scenes in Jaws The Revenge, when the Great White followed the Brody family and apparently roared for some reason. Gotta love it. Smile, you son of a Number 2. The Entity. It follows. The entity from It Follows was nothing if not persistent. This 2014 horror gem presented a unique premise, building upon the notion of a sexually transmitted infection and anthropomorphizing it into this unholy and supernatural chain letter. The entity follows the latest person with the mark and kills those behind them in a line. It can seemingly take the appearance of just about anyone and maintains awe-inspiring physical strength regardless of the body it chooses. Oh, oh. Oh, the scene at the swimming pool specifically showcases how the entity can handle multiple attackers at once and fight them all off with relative ease. The only way to keep it at bay is to create as much distance as possible, at any cost. Before we name our number one pick, here are a few honourable mentions. Pinhead 
Hellraiser franchise. Hooks, chains, and a whole lot of suffering. Oh, no tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. The Creeper, Jeepers Creepers franchise. The eyes have it. <laughs> The Tall Man, Phantasm franchise. The Undertaker and his pals. <laughs> Boy. Number one, Jason Voorhees, Friday the 13th franchise. Pure physical dominance. This perfectly describes Jason Voorhees, who's been crushing kids at Camp Crystal Lake for over 40 years. The little boy who wasn't a strong swimmer sure grew up to be a physically fit survivalist, as Voorhees is built like a brick house with intimidation to spare. Jason has been played by a number of actors and stuntmen over the years, but all of them bring their unique physical attributes to the role. Ted White and Steve Dash were early standouts, particularly Dash as Baghead Jason in part 2, while Derek Mears <coughs> killed it in the 2009 reboot. It's Kane Hodder who's most closely associated with Voorhees, however, bringing that heavy breathing and machete swinging swagger to the role for four installments. <laughs> There is no question that Michael Myers stands as one of the most deadly horror movie villains of all time. Heck, Michael's kill count started when he was just a little kid. In fact, Michael has had so many memorable kills that we just had to rank them. Take a look. Michael Myers is his name and murder is his game. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we'll be counting down our picks for the top 10 Michael Myers kills of all time. Okay, Linda. Come on out. For this list, we'll be looking at the most iconic kills performed by the legendary antagonist of the Halloween franchise. We'll be paying particular attention to the kills which left a lasting impact on the saga of Michael Myers, as well as murders which encapsulate the shape's terrifying persona. Number 10, Aaron and Dana, Halloween. You'd think working on a true crime podcast would have made these two extra careful. In 2018's Halloween, characters Aaron and Dana meet Michael as he is preparing to transfer to a new mental institution. You feel it, don't you, Michael? When Michael inevitably escapes, he tracks them down at a gas station where they become one of several victims. Excuse me, sir. Someone's in here. Approaching Dana slowly in a disgusting bathroom stall, he drops human teeth on the ground in front of her as a little preview of what's to come. As if this wasn't sinister enough, he uses Aaron's bloody head to beat in the stall door. Never lacking in creativity, this guy. Number 9. John Strode's Head Explosion Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers Few of Michael's victims had it coming like John Strode, the adoptive uncle of Michael's sister, Lori. John is a real estate agent who buys the Myers home after it is proven to be unsellable. You know. God. An abusive alcoholic, John frequently lashes out at his family and is especially resentful of his daughter, Kara. Upon returning home from work on Halloween, John discovers the power is out and goes down to the basement to investigate. After discovering some bloody sheets are clogging the washing machine, John runs into Michael and ends up being impaled on a fuse box, which leads to an explosive death. Number 8. Linda's Ghostly Strangling Halloween we couldn't possibly make this list without talking about Linda, one of the most memorable characters from the original Halloween film. Linda Vanderklok, one of Laurie Strode's best friends, was played by horror movie icon PJ Souls. 
cute, Bob. Real cute. Unaware that her boyfriend, Bob, has already had a deadly encounter with Michael Myers, Linda assumes it is Bob dressed as a ghost when a bespectacled ghoul enters her bedroom. When Bob doesn't respond to her, she decides to give Lori a call. Linda then finds out that her spooky visitor has much more sinister intentions. Michael strangles her to death with the phone cord while Lori listens. Talk about a haunting death. And are you all right? Number 7. Boiling Nurse Karen, Halloween 2 Picking up right where the original film left off, Halloween 2 continues to chronicle the events of Michael's homecoming. While stalking Lori in a Haddonfield hospital, Michael begins methodically killing off the hospital staff so no one can protect her. When Nurse Karen and ambulance driver Bud decide to get kinky in the hospital's therapy pool, Michael enacts one of the most unique kills in the franchise. After strangling Bud to death, Michael proceeds to drown Karen in the boiling hot pool, a murder which is made even more gruesome by Michael's prolonging of Karen's scalding suffering. Now, Bud, don't be that way. <laughs> Number 6. A Pitchfork for Spitz and a Scythe for Sam. Halloween 5. The Revenge of Michael Myers. If there's one thing to be said for the later Halloween sequels, it's that they definitely got more creative with the kills. <sighs> While having sex in a barn during a Halloween party, Sam and Spitz are unaware that they are being stalked by Haddonfield's resident boogeyman. Michael makes short work of Spitz by impaling him with a pitchfork, and then fetches a massive scythe in the tradition of the Grim Reaper himself. Although Sam courageously tries to defend herself using the pitchfork, Michael finishes her off with one clean stroke of his newfound weapon. Number 5. Stabbing Kelly with a Shotgun Halloween 4. The Return of Michael Myers if you ever wondered why Michael Myers doesn't use a gun to slay his victims, consider this kill as an argument for his hands-on approach to murder. I thought you might like some coffee. After Michael returns to his hometown, the main characters take refuge in the home of Haddonfield's sheriff while waiting for the state troopers to arrive. When the sheriff's daughter Kelly offers some coffee to a deputy guarding the front door, it takes her lighting a candle to realize that he's already dead. Although you'd think Michael would simply shoot her with the murdered deputy's shotgun, he instead opts for a grislier method and impales Kelly to the wall. He certainly loves getting up close and personal while working. Number 4. Strangle and Stab – Halloween Since Lori Strode's best friend Annie Brackett was the daughter of Haddonfield's sheriff, one might have assumed she'd be one of the survivors in the original Halloween. However, Annie instead became the victim of one of Michael Myers' most terrifying murders. Attacking her from the back seat of her car, Michael attempts to strangle Annie with one hand as she desperately tries to fight him off. Despite a resilient struggle, Michael finishes Annie off with a precise stab of his butcher's knife to her throat. Made even more frightening by the eerie haze of the fogged up windows, this kill furthered the film's not so subtle suggestion that Michael could attack from literally anywhere. Number 3. Michael's Rampage – Halloween When Halloween hit theaters in 2018, critics praised the film for bringing Michael Myers back to his roots after so many years. And this next kill is a good example of why. Shot in a series of long takes, we watch as Michael enters a home, takes out the owner, and locates his weapon of choice. Out in the street, a wholesome Halloween scene plays out, with Michael fitting in as just another trick-or-treater. Well, I'll keep my doors locked. Thanks for telling me. We overhear a neighbor being warned about the intruder, but by this time, it's much too late. Incorporating some modern flair to the suspense of the originals, this kill is probably the film's best. <laughs> Number 2. Stabbing Nurse Daniels – Halloween 2 Say what you want about Rob Zombie's reimagining of the Halloween franchise, but there's no denying he brought a horrifying intensity to his version of Michael Myers. In a homage to the original Halloween 2, Zombie's sequels begin with a similar sequence of Laurie Strode being chased through a hospital by her monstrous brother. Arguably the most famous kill of the film. A nurse played by Octavia Spencer finds herself in the unfortunate position of being between Michael and Laurie. What happens to her next is perhaps the most brutal murder in the entire franchise as Michael stabs the nurse repeatedly in a fit of homicidal fury. 
With all the blood and guts going around in all the Halloween films, it's hard to give you just 10. So here are some honorable mentions. Number one, the first kill, Halloween. It all began with this one. Shot in one single take, the first scene of the original Halloween film takes the audience on a journey into the darkness through the eyes of six-year-old Michael Myers. Framed through the eye holes of Michael's clown mask, the viewer follows Michael's perspective as he retrieves a huge knife from the kitchen drawer, ascends the staircase, and creeps into his sister Judith's bedroom. As Michael silently enters like a ghost, a naked Judith only notices she's not alone when it's too late. Made all the more disturbing due to its first-person point of view, this was the kill that gave birth to a horror movie legend. Michael? movie villains not only dish out punishment, they also take on plenty of damage. Yes, people have tried many ways to off these lethal killers, but as we're about to see, most of those attempts, no matter how crazy, usually prove fruitless. Careful. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life for one last scare. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 craziest things horror movie villains survived. When you leave a man for dead, make sure he's really dead. He's dead enough. No, Daddy, no. God, help me. For this list, we'll be ranking the most absurd and over-the-top death sequences that still fail to put horror movie villains down for good. Given that we'll be discussing the climaxes of these films, a spoiler alert is now in effect. Can you think of any examples we missed? Number 10, Kandarian Magic, Evil Dead 2. Ash Williams put it best. For God's sake. There honestly doesn't seem to be anything that can truly stop the evil entity in Sam Raimi's Evil Dead franchise. It can only be contained. When Annie recites an ancient Kandarian incantation, the evil force appears to be on the ropes. But not even finishing that bit of Necronomicon magic can get the job done. Instead, the evil sucks Ash and his Oldsmobile into the past, where Williams is once again forced to face demonic possession in the sequel, Army of Dead darkness. And then again in Ash vs Evil Dead. Yo, Granny. Hope you took your Geritol. Time to dance! This evil just refuses to stay dead. Number 9. Falling. King Kong. It's one of the most iconic moments in monster movie history. When King Kong falls from the Empire State Building in the 1933 film, shot down by aircraft fire. Kong in the Dino De Laurentiis production from 1976, falling is apparently no big deal. The 1976 King Kong ends with Skull Island's finest suffering a colossal fall from the Twin Towers down to World Trade Center Plaza. At the time, all signs pointed to it being the end of Kong, but 1986's King Kong Lives reveals that the ape survived and has been kept in a comatose state. Until, of course, he's not. <laughs> The 
film even introduces Lady Kong as a blood donor and love interest, plus Baby Kong. So cute! Number 8, being buried in a mine shaft. Phantasm. The Phantasm franchise is perhaps among horror's most underrated. It's a captivating series of films defined by dream logic, surreal imagery, and an all time banger of a soundtrack. <laughs> Coscarelli's OG Phantasm movie sees the series antagonist, the tall man, buried alive by falling rocks inside an abandoned mine shaft. This seems to take care of him, until, that is, the last few seconds of the movie. The tall man's mystical backstory and evil mortuary minions made him a horror icon. Actor Angus Scrim returned again and again as the tall man in one form or another for four sequels, the last of which was 2016's Phantasm Ravager. Our paths cross again. Number 7, Drowning. I know what you did last summer. There are few fishermen as difficult to kill as Ben Willis. <laughs> This one-time hit-and-run victim returned for two additional movies, the second time in an undead state. His sole purpose? Terrorising those who did him wrong. And Willis established a classic 90s horror franchise in the process. In the first film, Julie and Ray are facing off with Willis on his boat, the Billy Blue, when the fisherman's hook hand gets caught in some rigging, pulling him up until it's severed. Then Willis is tossed overboard, presumably drowning. <laughs> Except we all know that he wasn't really dead. He was just waiting to set up the sequel. Well, don't worry. The body will turn up. They usually do. Number six, Puberty Love. Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. We know what you're thinking. Watch Mojo has a officially lost it. But no, we assure you that this wasn't a typo. Puberty Love is actually the name of a song sung at the end of 1978's Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, and one which, for uh, reasons, shrivels down the produce so that they can be squashed. Cover your ears, everyone! <laughs> It's certainly an original way to get rid of your horror movie villain, and the song, believe it or not, is actually sung by future Soundgarden drummer Matt Cameron. Oh, and want to know how the town gets rid of the one super smart tomato that thought of wearing earmuffs? Sheet music. <laughs> Of course, one killer crop deserves another, and sure enough, the tomatoes returned. <laughs> Number 5, Dr. Channard, Hellbound Hellraiser 2. The Doctor. It's a controversial opinion, but one could make a case that Hellbound Hellraiser 2 is even better than the first film in this classic franchise. There's more character development for starters, but also just plenty of Xenobite action from Pinhead and his crew. The real test for these franchise villains is an encounter with a greater evil, however, in the form of Dr. Channard. <laughs> At first, it seems as if this evil versus evil matchup is going to be epic, but the newly Cenobitan Channard makes short work of all the opposing Cenobites, including the legendary Pinhead. I'm taking over. 
this operation, and you girls will be my first patient. It's a cool scene, allowing us to see more of who the Xenobites were in human form, but it didn't stop Pinhead from returning for many future Hellraiser installments. Number 4 being shot, burnt, melted and blown up. Child's Play franchise. We've got to hand it to both Charles Lee Ray and Chucky the Killer Doll. They're quite resilient. It takes real commitment to swap your life force into a doll, but survive Ray does, and in his disarming new form, he continues his maniacal killing spree. <laughs> after becoming Chucky, the iconic killer has repeatedly been taken down by some combination of hot, sticky and or flammable substances. The first Child's Play sees the doll being burned in the fireplace and shot in the heart. The sequel ups the ante by covering Chucky in burning melted plastic and blowing up his head. This didn't stop him of course, as we're still enjoying the maniacal little doll's rampages to this very day. <laughs> Number 3 – Oxygen Destroyers, Volcanoes and more – Godzilla Franchise How many times can we stop Godzilla? Let us count the ways. The King of the Monsters has faced every sort of demise throughout his storied career, and yet he always seems to find ways to make a roaring and triumphant return. Doesn't matter whether it's the Oxygen Destroyer falling into a volcano in Return of Godzilla, or suffering a full-blown meltdown in Godzilla vs Destoroyer, Big G takes a licking and just keeps ticking. Of course, we realise that Godzilla isn't always portrayed as an antagonist, and that sometimes the roots of his rampage are outside forces. Still, there are few monsters out there that have died as many deaths as the G-Man. <laughs> Number 2 – Just About Everything – Friday the 13th Franchise Like mother, like son. Killer instincts seem to run in the family, but while Pamela Voorhees stayed dead after her brutal decapitation at the end of the original Friday the 13th, her son Jason refuses to quit. <laughs> The final chapter saw Corey Feldman slice Jason pretty convincingly with a machete, while Jason Lives saw Voorhees chained down at the bottom of Crystal Lake. But wait, there's more. Flushed away by toxic waste? Check. Pulled under by the protagonist's dead dad? Double check. Heck, Jason's even survived being taken to hell, fighting Freddy Krueger and a Michael Bay produced remake. If that isn't resilience, we don't know what is. Number 1 – Fire – Halloween Franchise There are few things more final than fire when it comes to the world of death in a horror movie. That is, unless your name is Michael Myers. That's because Myers has been incinerated not once, but twice, and managed to come out of the other side with only minor injuries. First, there's the huge explosion at the climax of Halloween 2, where Dr. Sam Loomis sacrifices himself to rid Haddonfield of the shape once and for all. It's time, Michael. Except both Loomis and Myers somehow survived to fight another day for several sequels. Meanwhile, the forthcoming Halloween Kills shows us that the fiery end of 2018's Halloween was apparently not hot enough, because Michael is back at it again. Not that we're complaining, of course. Michael Myers is flesh and blood. 
But a man couldn't have survived that fire. For years, fans have speculated who would win showdowns between some horror movie icons. And while we did get a Freddy vs. Jason big screen film, many were kind of hoping that Jason would be pitted against, you know, someone his own size. Why, Michael Myers seems to fit the bill. Every madman has a hook, sometimes literally. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and in this installment of Versus, we're pitting Michael Myers against Jason Voorhees. For this video, we'll be looking at two of the most iconic slasher villains to ever grace the big screen to determine whether it's the masked machete-wielding maniac or the masked chef's knife-wielding maniac who reigns supreme. Let's get started. Round number one. Origins. Slasher villains of the 1980s, the height of the genre, always came prepackaged with an origin story. This would usually give them some sort of motive for hacking away at libidinous teens. Come, dear. It will be easier for you than it was for Jason. And you have to give the original Friday the 13th some credit for its unexpected twist, that it was the drowned Jason's loony, overprotective mother doing the slashing. By part two, however, the supposedly deceased Jason takes center stage in the franchise, avenging both his drowning and his mother's death. That's a good boy. Good Jason. Basically, he's an overgrown man-child with mommy issues. This is where Halloween really stands out, as even though we witnessed Michael's first heinous act, through his own eyes no less, we're never really given a reason. Michael? His nemesis, Dr. Loomis, gives several monologues about how Michael is the living embodiment of evil, but no motive is ever offered. I met him 15 years ago. I, I was told there was nothing left, no reason. No uh, conscience, no understanding, and even the most rudimentary sense of life or death, of, of good or evil. While some of the sequels attempted and failed at some backstory, even linking Laurie Strode to the villain, the recent sequel boot and its upcoming follow-ups are going to back those roots. The ones that can go anywhere, without logic or understanding. While Jason has a clearer motivation, the mystery surrounding Michael is what makes him so fascinating. There was nobody outside. There was. What do you look like? The Boogeyman. He grabs our attention from the film's horrifying opening scene, securing Michael's victory for this round. Round two, enemies. Every Moby Dick needs their Captain Ahab, and slashers are no exception. Remember me, Jason? Jason, don't you remember? But who could possibly stand up to such a leviathan? A walking, hulking wrecking ball seemingly undeterred by bullets, car crashes, or even explosions. Run, Tommy, run! For Jason, the answer is different in almost every entry. Just another teen fortunate enough not to break any horror movie cliches to be the final girl or guy. Of course, Tommy Jarvis is a unique case. You gotta do something. Jason's alive. He killed my friend, and now he's coming for me. Played by three different actors over the course of three films, it was originally planned for Jarvis to take Jason's mantle at the end of A New Beginning. But by part six, he was back to playing the hero, trying to rescue teens at Camp Crystal Lake from a reanimated Jason. He's been here once tonight. I think he'll come back. Until his death, Dr. Samuel Loomis, masterfully played by actor Donald Pleasant, served as a perfect counterpart to Michael Myers, lending a bit of an English gravitas and class to a franchise often considered seedy. In many ways, he was the ideal patient. He, he didn't talk, he didn't cry, he didn't even move. He just waited. He was a doctor, based in reason and logic, confronted with an illogical evil. And in Loomis' absence, audiences slowly witnessed Jamie Lee Curtis's transition from the final girl to the hardcore survivalist in the 2018 film. Meyer's backstory may be vague, but his antagonists are well drawn. Michael just had more to face, taking another round. Winner, Michael. Round three, abilities. It's pretty much a given that a bullet or a knife isn't going to stop either Michael or Jason in their tracks, but each has what Liam Neeson would call a certain set of skills ideally suited to their environment. 
Whereas Michael is subtle, quiet, and downright stealthy, Jason has no problem bursting through doors with brute force. It brings plenty of horrific tension to the Halloween films when Michael is stalking his victims, particularly the way director John Carpenter shot it, with Michael suddenly appearing in the background. The holiday also gives him the right cover, given that everyone is wearing a mask. But it's hard to beat Jason's lack of, to put it gently, tact. He's also much more adept at appearing out of nowhere. The Michael Bay-produced reboot tried to offer an explanation that he moved through a series of underground tunnels, but just having him pop up where least expected is half of the fun of a Friday movie. Add that to an inventive use of everyday items for creative kills and super strength, and you have Jason's first win. Winner, Jason. Michael Myers 2, Jason 1. Round 4, Costume. From Freddy's ratty red and green sweater to My Bloody Valentine's coal miner getup, an iconic slasher is bound to have a trademark design. Who are you? What are you doing? A slasher's outfit becomes a part of their calling card, just as significant as their trademark weapon. So in this twisted, macabre fashion show, who wore it better? Michael certainly wore it first, a William Shatner mask spray-painted white with the hair teased out, but the rest of his outfit could be found at the nearest gas station. Though Jason didn't receive his hockey mask from one of his victims until part three, he was rarely seen without it. When he was, the rotting zombie underneath was just as scary. The mask even allowed a bit of levity in what would otherwise be considered a total gore fest. And then there are the upgrades that Jason X provided. They're plenty silly, but more inventive than just a simple random white mask. I'd say it got better. It's been modified. Come on, you think? We've got to hand this one to Mr. Voorhees. Winner, Jason. Michael and Jason have even the score at two apiece. Round five, scares. A solid horror franchise lives or dies by its scares. With recurring characters and decades worth of film reels, however, franchises have a tendency to lose their edge or, worse, dip into meta territory. At that point, it's as if they aren't even trying, just going through the motions, on to the next splatter fest. What's the tipping point when you know it's Jump the Shark? Well, both franchises came out of the gate strong, even though Friday was essentially just a cash-in on Halloween's success. The latter of the two are the only films that still set out to frighten audiences. <laughs> Jason is just there to slice and dice. But going back to the basic premise of the films, Halloween has a more frightening idea. Well, I'll keep my door. Thanks for telling. Pure, unadulterated evil appearing in any town USA was a relatively new idea in the 70s when monsters generally came from space or some kind of outer threat. At its core, Friday is a simple revenge story, the sort we've seen a dozen times before. Sorry, creepy woodsmen, but we're much more scared of our own neighborhoods than some remote campsite. It was close, but the horror from Haddonfield edged it out at the end. Michael 3, Jason 2. Winner, Michael. All right, let's face it. It can't be easy to portray a horror movie villain. Most of them are just overly sadistic and twisted. But boy, oh boy, have there been some doozy performances over the years. So here now are the most over-the-top ones for your enjoyment. Yeah, you're gonna love this one. It's a scream, baby. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 over the top horror movie villain performances. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Credence Leonor Gilgood of ancient druid origins. Hi, I know what you're thinking. This is a weird help, but I can handle it. <laughs> you shall never retrieve the Necronomicon. 
You'll die in the graveyard before you get it. Hey, uh, what's that you got on your face? Huh? For this list, we're looking at performances in horror movies where actors really hammed it up as the bad guy. We're not saying these were bad performances, they're just different. Which of these performances did you find to be a little much? Let us know in the comments. Also, please note, there will be spoilers. Number 10, Matthew Lillard as Stu Marker. Scream. Throughout the movie, Matthew Lillard plays Stu as a total goofball. He's always cracking jokes and pulling silly faces. Oh! <laughs> Dork. <laughs> Jesus, this place is back tonight, man. We had a run in the mass murder scene. During the final act, however, when Stu is revealed to be one of the killers, Matthew Lillard really lets loose with the character, amping up the quirks. Lillard's performance at the climax was a nice contrast to Skeet Ulrich, who played the other killer, Billy, and was more sinister with his role. I know. Tell that to Cotton Weary. Wouldn't believe how easy he was to frame. To liven up his performance, Lillard reportedly ad-libbed some of his dialogue, including his response to being accidentally struck with the phone. Ah, hit me with the phone, Dick! <laughs> Number 9, Brad Dourif as Chucky, Child's Play franchise. If you're providing the voice of a killer doll in a horror movie, you can either be subtle and creepy, or you can play it big. With Chucky, Oscar-nominated actor Brad Dourif went with the latter option. You little shit, do you know what you've done? It's too late! I've spent too much time in this body! All of Chucky's reactions are larger than life, whether he's laughing maniacally, screaming in terror, or intimidating someone into following his pint-sized orders. From the first scene in the original Child's Play, where we see him voice the doll, Dourif never fails to make an impression. I said talk to me, damn it, or else I'm gonna throw you in the fire! You stupid bitch, you filthy slut! As the series gradually became a more self-aware comedy, Dourif naturally made Chucky even more over the top. I'm one of the most notorious slashers in history, and I don't want to give that up. I am Chucky, the killer doll, and I dig it! Number 8, Warwick Davis as the Leprechaun. Leprechaun franchise. Let's be honest, when it comes to playing a killer leprechaun, the concept is so ridiculous that Warwick Davis had no choice but to play the role as extremely over the top. Pit, there's only one way. One way to kill a leprechaun. But I'm not going to tell you. I'll never tell you. <laughs> the character was a departure for Davis, who was known for movies such as Return of the Jedi and Willow, but it gave him a chance to show a new sinister side. I don't like what I'm seeing. Two leprechauns is one too many, lad. Davis, ever the committed performer, strikes an interesting balance, delivering just enough genuine menace while also being whimsically silly. Davis's portrayal of the leprechaun was so memorable and absurd that the sequels in the series sent the character to Las Vegas, the inner city, and even outer space. Number 7, Christian Bale as Patrick Bateman, American Psycho. Based on Brett Easton Ellis's 1991 novel, this film centers on Patrick Bateman, a disturbed Wall Street investment banker who explores all manner of sick and twisted desires. My nightly bloodlust has overflowed into my days. I feel lethal, on the verge of frenzy. I think my mask of sanity about to slip. According to director Mary Harron, Christian Bale actually took inspiration for his performance as Bateman from an interview that Tom Cruise gave on David Letterman. More specifically, he was inspired by the friendliness and intense energy that Cruise displayed. Look at that subtle off-white coloring. The tasteful thickness of it. Oh my god. It even has a watermark. Something wrong, Patrick? Bale 
Bale's performance was all around odd, but utterly captivating, and he certainly nailed the intensity. Bateman was aggressively snobby when he was around his friends, and completely unhinged when he was engaging in violent acts. Who can forget the infamous Huey Lewis scene? In 87, Huey released this. Four, their most accomplished album. I think their undisputed masterpiece is Hip to Be Square. A song so catchy, most people probably don't listen to the lyrics, but they should. Number six, Bruce Campbell as Evil Ash, Army of Darkness. Sam Raimi's Evil Dead series has never shied away from absurdity. The villains, in particular, are downright maniacal. I'll swallow your soul! Come get some. In the third entry, however, the filmmaker upped the ante by giving Ash himself, Bruce Campbell, a chance to play one of the baddies. Campbell played an evil version of his iconic character, and the malevolent doppelganger was every bit as silly as the original Ash, with the added bonus of a sinister twist. Are you me? What I do, I do me! <laughs> You sound like a jerk! After introducing himself, Evil Ash pesters the other Ash with childish taunts. Watching Bruce Campbell interact with himself and engage in violent slapstick was one of the highlights of the movie, if not the entire series. Hey! Hey! What's the big what's idea to take a bite? Why, Why you? you? <gasps> oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh! Oh! I'm blind! Number five, Vincent Price as Edward Lionheart. Theatre of Blood. With a whole career's worth of over-the-top performances to his name, Vincent Price more than earned his reputation for being campy. An opinion I find myself incapable of sharing. His roles in horror movies like House on Haunted Hill and the abominable Dr. Phoebes were both strong contenders for a spot on our list. But Edward Lionheart has them all beat. We've denied you nothing. For 30 years, the public has acknowledged that I was the master. And that this year, my season of Shakespeare was the shining jewel in the crown of the immortal bard. In this 1973 film, Price plays a bad actor who dishes out gruesome punishments to theatre critics he felt had unfairly smeared him with unflattering reviews. A Shakespearean trained actor who takes himself too seriously and puts on ridiculous costumes? This is the role that Price was born to play. It's a very interesting play, don't you think so, Miss Moon? Especially that scene where Joan of Arc dies at the stake. <laughs> Though I'm afraid you might find our novel version of it a bit of a shock. Number four, Nicolas Cage as Peter Lowe, Vampire's Kiss. It's hard to think of an actor more famous for being over the top than Nicolas Cage. In this horror comedy, Cage plays a New York literary agent who believes he's becoming a vampire and begins to suffer a mental breakdown. I'm a vampire! 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 Each and every scene is an opportunity for Cage to one-up himself and showcase just how weird he can get. From the enthusiastic way he recites the alphabet to actually eating a live cockroach on camera. It's a lot. This is also the film that gave us that iconic Nicolas Cage meme. You know the one. It's that great, you don't say, meme. Vampire's Kiss is truly the gift that keeps on giving. I couldn't think of a more horrible job if I wanted to. And you have to do it. You have to, or I'll fire you, do you understand? Number three, Tim Curry as Pennywise, It. Aren't you going to say hello? While Bill Skarsgård certainly put his own spin on the character of Pennywise, Tim Curry still has him beat when it comes to being over the top. Curry leaned into the clownish aspects of Pennywise, making jokes and yucking it up while he tormented the children of Derry. <laughs> ah! I'll kill you all! <laughs> I'll drive you crazy and I'll kill you all. I'm every nightmare you ever had. I am your worst dream come true. And when the Losers Club grew up and returned as adults, he kept the jokes coming. Bringing bravado to every scene in which he appears, Curry really lived up to his role as an interdimensional being and eater of worlds. If you see. Hey, excuse me, sir. Do you have Prince Albert in a can? 
you do when you better let the poor guy out. <laughs> Curry's Pennywise was a memorable example of how over-the-top acting doesn't necessarily ruin a horror film, it can actually elevate it. Number 2. Robert Englund as Freddy Krueger, a Nightmare on Elm Street franchise Robert Englund was able to distinguish Freddy from other horror villains of the era by making him a trash talker with a flair for the dramatic. Please God. This is God. In the original film, we got to see a little bit of this side of Freddy as he taunted his victims, but he was saving the best material for later. As the series progressed, Freddy's penchant for being over the top became more and more amplified. No screaming while the bus is in motion! By Freddy's dead, Freddy had become a full on Looney Tune, with shameless gags such as playing with the power glove and impersonating the Wicked Witch of the West. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little soul too! <laughs> Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few honourable mentions. Betty Davis as Jane, Baby Jane Hudson, whatever happened to Baby Jane. Betty Davis was delightfully disturbing as the titular washed up child star. Now when I'm very good and do as I am told, I'm mama's little angel and papa says I'm good as gold. Betsy Palmer as Mrs Voorhees, Friday the 13th. Betsy Palmer looked particularly deranged when she broke out in Jason's voice. Don't let her get away, Mommy. Don't let her live. I won't, Jason. I won't. Eric Freeman as Ricky, Silent Night, Deadly Night, Part 2. Eric Freeman's performance uplifted what would have otherwise been a forgettable film. Carpet Day! Huh? No! <laughs> Christopher Lee as Dracula. Dracula. Lee brought an intimidating presence to the iconic role. <laughs> Number 1. Jack Nicholson as Jack Torrance. The Shining. What's the first thing that comes to mind when thinking of an over the top performance in a horror movie? Wendy. <coughs> Let me explain something to you. Whenever you come in here and interrupt me, you're breaking my concentration. You're distracting me. And it will then take me time to get back to where I was. More often than not, it's Jack Nicholson going all out as a psycho axe murderer. Under the direction of Stanley Kubrick, Nicholson gave an unhinged performance which perfectly captured one man's descent into madness. Whether he was just staring blankly or snapping at Shelley Duvall's Wendy, he never lets up with the intensity. Give me the bat. Stop it! Give me the bat. Stop swinging the bat. Perhaps the greatest contribution Nicholson gave to his performance was improvising the line, Here's Johnny! after tearing down the door. Here's Johnny! Absurd, shocking, and oh so quotable. It's the whole package. Any horror movie fan will tell you that the best horror movie villains came out in the 1980s. That was the best year for horror. Or, or wait, was it the 1990s? Yeah, the 90s were the best horror movie. No, it was the 80s. If only there was a way to settle this. We'll tear your soul apart. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and in this installment of Versus, we're comparing the 1980s and 1990s to see which reigned supreme as the better decade for horror movies. It rubs the lotion on its skin, or else it gets the hose again. We're gonna get you, not another piece. You hang up on me again, I'll cut you like a fish, understand? We're going to consider the horror trends for each decade, the best heroes, and of course, the best villains, to help determine which decade was stronger overall. Which era of horror haunts your dreams the most? Round 1. Villains 
You can't have a good horror movie without a good antagonist. In some cases, the bad guys and girls are so compelling, we kind of hope they get away with it. This is especially true if the people they're chasing down are particularly insufferable, as is the case with many 80s slashers. <laughs> But the 80s still provided us with some unforgettable villains. Please, God. This is God. For one, it marked the arrival of A Nightmare on Elm Street's Freddy Krueger and the Friday the 13th series' Jason Voorhees, who would face off in the 2000s. While he was introduced in 1978's Halloween, Michael Myers still saw plenty of bloody action in the 80s. And let's not forget the start of the Hellraiser franchise and the introduction of Pinhead, or Jack Nicholson's unhinged performance in The Shining. I'm not gonna hurt you. <gasps> Stay away from me! Wendy? Stay away! Darling, light of my life. I'm not gonna hurt you. You didn't let me finish my sentence. I said, I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. Slasher doll Chucky was introduced in 1988's Child's Play, but we consider him more of a 90s symbol. Just like the good old days. Nothing like a strangulation to get the circulation going. Other great 90s villains include Scream's Ghostface, Candyman, and of course, Hannibal Lecter. A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. Kathy Bates' frightening work as Annie Wilkes in Misery is another great Oscar-winning horror performance from this decade. You did it! You did it! You did it! You did it! You murdered my misery! Annie! Although the 90s has plenty of quality evil, we have to give this round to the 80s for how enduring these villains have been and how many films they've spawned. 80s 1, 90s 0. <laughs> One down, two to go. Round two, heroes. Never underestimate the importance of a protagonist in a horror movie. Without someone to identify with and root for, a horror movie can be nothing more than an excuse for blood and guts. Two strong examples of horror heroes, or in this case heroines, are Laurie Strode, played by Jamie Lee Curtis in Halloween 2, and Nancy Thompson, played by Heather Langenkamp in A Nightmare on Elm Street and Dream Warriors. Why now, Piggy? On the male side of things, Bruce Campbell's performance as Ash in the Evil Dead films has rightfully made him a horror legend. The strong horror heroine trend continued in the 90s. Freeze! Put your hands over your head and turn around. Spread your legs. Spread your legs. Put your hands in the back. Thumbs up. Freeze! Jodie Foster won an Oscar for her role as FBI agent Clarice Starling in The Silence of the Lambs, and Neve Campbell's performance as Sidney Prescott helped to ground the Scream franchise. In your dreams. <laughs> We also rooted for Bruce Willis and Haley Joel Osment in The Sixth Sense, as well as the students lost in the woods in The Blair Witch Project. God! No. Oh, no. You've got to be kidding me! This is a joke! No. This is another close call, but we have to go with the 90s for taking the seeds that the 80s planted and growing them even further. These performances aren't always the flashiest ones, and that's what makes them so strong. They give us something to latch onto as we enter these worlds of unknowable and unthinkable horrors. 80s 1, 90s 1. Sydney, can you tell us how it feels to be a hero? Round three, Scare Factor. What's that? <sighs> 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 
Being chased by a masked psychopath with a sharp object is certainly scary to imagine or experience. However, it can occasionally get a little tedious if not done right. 80s slashers like A Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th weren't scary because they involved brutal death scenes. They were scary because they understood how to use suspense to build terror with an audience. Unfortunately, there are plenty of forgettable slashers that only cared about gore and not about thrills. The 90s took things in a more psychological direction, but that still provided plenty of frights. You got what you deserved. He's alive! He's alive! Seven told the story of an unrelenting maniac from the perspective of two detectives trying to track him down. The Blair Witch Project focused on our fear of the unseen to terrifying effect. And while Hannibal Lecter might be best known for eating people, he is a former psychiatrist. And part of his scare factor comes from how well he can manipulate people, even when they think they're safe from him. Wake up in the dark and hear the screaming of the lamb. We always appreciate horror that makes us think more than they make us wince. The 90s wins this round, for giving us multiple examples of great horror movies that skimp on the blood and deliver on the brains. 80s 1, 90s 2. You fly back to school now, little starling. Fly, fly, fly. Round 4, Originality. A new take on horror is all too rare, with too many studios just trying to cash in on whatever's hot. The best horror films of the 80s were the ones that brought us new takes on the genre and kicked off some very enduring franchises. Nancy, uh, help me please. Save me from Freddy. Can you imagine horror today without the influence of A Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th and The Evil Dead, as well as their associated characters? You will die! Like the others before you. One by one, we will take you. But we also appreciate how the 90s took horror in a new direction. So, Mr. Originality, how would you make it different? I'd let the geek get the girl. One of the best examples of the old influencing the new is in the Scream series. Here, Elm Street director Wes Craven deconstructed some of the tropes he helped to popularize. Never, ever, ever under any circumstances say, I'll be right back. The Blair Witch Project showed us just how scary found footage horror could be, and The Sixth Sense delivered a meditation on grief and letting go, disguised as a ghost story. I think I can go now. Just needed to do a couple things. The 80s wins this round because of how many amazing series started this decade. There have been reboots of so many 80s franchises because studios recognize how valuable these properties are and how enduring the characters are. This decade truly feels like a game changing one when it comes to the ingenuity in horror movies. 80s 2, 90s 2. Oh. No tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. Round 5. Overall quality. This is probably the hardest round of them all. Both the 80s and 90s have contributed some of the finest horror films of all time. For the 80s, we have outstanding chillers like A Nightmare on Elm Street, The Thing, The Shining, and The Evil Dead. <laughs> if you don't like any of these movies, you simply don't like horror. If you've seen those and are looking for some more great 80s horror, we recommend Poltergeist, The Fly, and Reanimator. You killed him! No, I did not. I gave him life. But horror in the 90s was anything but a step down. The Silence of the Lambs Best Picture win showed that horror deserved to be treated just as seriously as any other genre. You're very frank, Doris. I think it would be quite something to know you in private life. 
Meanwhile, Scream was a sharp satire that still worked as a traditional slasher, and The Blair Witch Project showed how much tension could be created with a camcorder. I'm scared to close my eyes. <laughs> To open them. Other 90s horror films we love include Kronos, Brain Dead, and Candyman. Be my victim. You can't go wrong with either decade, but when it comes to overall movie quality, we have to give it to the 90s. In addition to the ones that we've already mentioned, we still get shivers watching J horror classics like Ringu, Oscar winners like Misery, and even remakes that arguably live up to the original, like Night of the Living Dead. And we're sure they'll hold up for decades to come. 80s 2, 90s 3. It was a close race, but the 90s ekes out on victory for horror movie supremacy. <laughs> Don't f with the chuck. <laughs> All right, well, that's going to do it for this chilling deep dive into the world of horror and their biggest and baddest villains. I've been Matt from Watch Mojo, and I'll see you next time.